Ezekiel chapter number 44. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east. It was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut. I got a note here, 1543, it was shut by the Turks. It shall not be opened. No man shall enter in by it. Because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince, 34, 24, 37, 25. The prince shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. That's David. He shall enter by the way of the porch of the gate and shall go out by the way of the same. So here's a particular gate that no man can open but God. And it will, will only be open for one man. And that man is going to sit as a prince and eat before the Lord Jesus Christ. Then brought he me the way of the north gate before the house. And I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And I fell upon my face. He's humbled. Imagine if that happened today with Christian. Well, turn away, can't go in. And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well. And behold with thy eyes, and hear with, with thine ears all that I say unto thee command, concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord, and all the laws thereof, and mark well the entering in of the house, and every going forth of the sanctuary. Take note. You're supposed to take Bible notes. The Bible says, Jeremiah, you're to mark your Bible. That's a Bible command. Your Bible is supposed to be your reference, your tool. Wouldn't it be funny just by chance, I don't know, if Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass. Wouldn't it be just funny if your Bible is brought to you in glory forever? I don't know. It's something. My Bible's got dates and prayers and notes and all kinds of things. Coffee stains and and thou shalt say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, present time. We've been seeing the future, now we're back in the present. Thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations. In that ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart. And we just read that with Abraham today. Uncircumcised in flesh. To be in my sanctuary. So they brought Gentiles in. They brought them. Not that the Babylonian army came in, but the Jews were allowing anybody to go in. There was a king that brought in his own altar and moved God's altar out of the way for his altar to pollute it. That's interesting. People who are not of God in God's building, God says pollute it. So, how about this? We're going to have a fellowship this Saturday. Bring all your family and friends who are not saved into the church house. Bring them in the company and the fellowship of God's people. Do you know there's coming a day that God will separate those that are saved, his bride, from those that are not saved? That if it's on a church day, there'll be people still sitting in the pews after the rapture has happened? You realize strangers, those that are uncircumcised in heart and the flesh, have polluted your lives. You brought them in. So 
Why are many churches failing today? Look who you brought in. So we can have numbers. Even my house. When he offered my bread. And let's talk about the priest. The fat. The bread was on the table in the holy place. The fat was upon the altar. The brazen altar. And the blood was upon the brazen altar. And they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. They still brought their sacrifices. They still came to the temple. They still did what the law taught. But they were uncircumcised in heart. They were abomination. Abominable in the eyes of God. And they were still serving. Typical Christians in church today. There are Christians who go to church today. And when they go home, they're drinking. They're smoking. They're carousing. They're... Don't you think that every person sitting in the church house on their off time away from the church house are living godly lives? You just never know what may be going on underneath your roof. And you need to pray. I think my family can speak up for the fact is that I prayed one time to find out what's going on. And you don't know what's going on. Sometimes it may be time to clean house. And only a few times in the kings of Judah had they gone in there and cleaned house and gotten things right and had a revival in their heart. Ye have not kept the charge of my holy thing. Where are those holy things today? In Ezekiel's time, I mean. The king of Balaam has got them locked up in his strong house. Except for the Ark of the Covenant, that's going to heaven. And those things are not released unto Ezra and Nehemiah. And even the Ark of the Covenant is still in heaven, according to Revelation. But ye have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. Oh, the great I, me, myself ministry. We don't have a holy day. We have a holiday with an I in the middle of it. Thus saith Lord God, no stranger, uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in the flesh. That uncircumcision of the flesh, according to what he told Abraham, your soul was cut off. You know what happens if a Jew was uncircumcised or anybody that was in a Jewish home of servitude or anything like that? When they died, they went to hell because they are disobeying what God told them to do. How would you like to bring that? And that was even happening in Acts. That was happening uh, what Paul's writing to one of the churches. They're trying, you know, you need to be circumcised. That's not what the church is. We're speaking to a bunch of Jews. Now, in the church age, we're talking about uncircumcision of the heart. Greece. We've got Christians with high cholesterol. Shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. So what was the problem with the New Testament? They were trying to get the Gentiles under the law, which Ezekiel wrote and said, hey, it's wrong. And the Levites that are going away far from me. Read Malachi. The whole book. When Israel went astray, which went astray away from me after their idols. There's a problem. We've read all that through Jeremiah. We talked about that last night when that idol shepherd sits where he ought not to sit. And that wasn't I D L E, that's I D O L. They shall even bear their iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having charge at the gates of the house, and ministering to the house. They shall slay the burnt offerings and the sacrifice for the people. Here we go. Back with the sacrifices in the millennium. And they shall stand before them to minister unto them. The Levites, again, are going to do what needs to be done in the temple and for the people. 
They're going to do what the people can't do. Remember when John the Baptist's father goes in there, the people are outside, and he's offering the, the incense to the people while they're praying. They can't go into the holy place. Only particular priests were allowed to go in there. The people can bring their sacrifice, but they can't offer them upon the altar. It has to be done by God's people, the Levites, the priests of the Levites. See, God has an order. You've got to do it his way. You can't do it your way. Your way ends up in ashes at the judgment seat of Christ. Because they ministered unto them before their idols. Oh, they still had idolatry and still doing what God. You cannot do what God said to do and do what you want to do. You can't serve God in that mammon. You can't add a, your independent clause to what you want to do, what God tells us to do, in your own program ideas or thoughts. You'll be found lacking. You'll be found to be a sinner. And cause the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. When they did what they were supposed to do with God and brought sin, brought idolatry in, and brought in abominations, the nation fell. You know why the churches are falling and have fallen? Because you did what God told you to do, and you added idolatry. You added abominations. That's why the church has failed. You try to mix a little world and a little godliness, and you get a mess. Using Satan and his ways for God, and you think it's going to come out right. Therefore have I lifted up my hand against them. When you use the world or Satan with God, even if you're doing it right, but you got a little bit of Satan, you got a little bit of God, God says, I'm against you. Saith the Lord God, and they shall bear their iniquity. You know, the, the worst iniquity you can have in the church age today is telling someone they're saved and they're not. Just say this little prayer. That is iniquity. That is idolatry. Just, you know, the prayer becomes God. And they shall not come near unto me to do the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. Oh, Lord, I come up and do this. No. Why not? Because you're a sinner. You've sinned. But, Lord, I'm going to pastor this church. Oh, no, you're not. Why not? Because you committed adultery. You stole money. And you bear that shame. Here was once a preacher. Now he's no more. Why? Because of sin. Not because of retirement. Not because, you know, people drifted away and didn't want to serve the Lord anymore. And he just quietly, you know, ran out of people. No, because of your sin, because of your shame, you're not in that office no more. And what's sorry is that churches do have pastors that have committed adultery, that have sinned, and we feel so sorry for him. And God looks at it, it's abomination, and I've turned my face against it. And it's wrong. And that's the preaching of sin. And that's the preaching of truth. And if you don't like it, you take it up with God. Not all churches are right. But I will make them keepers of the, of the charge of the house. For all the service thereof. For all that shall be done therein. Today you still say, you still can witness as, as a sinner. You're not going to have that position that you had before. When that guy was, was, was committing a, a sin with his father's wife. All right. He was de -church. He got right. He, they brought him back in the church. You still are saved. You're still serving. You just can't go back. You just have to be. Oh, you used to be a pastor. You used to be in, in charge of this church. You would have to probably move somewhere else.
Today, you don't lose your salvation. You just lose your position. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, your sons of Zadok, a faithful priest that kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me. So when Israel went astray, Zadok and his sons, the sons of Zadok, continue to be faithful. They shall come near to me to minister to me. So what you learn from the sons of Zadok is you remain faithful when everybody else is gone to sin. If you stay right and do right, God is going to reward you a rewarding above those that didn't do right. A lesson from the Old Testament that passes on to the New Testament. You do right besides the fact that others do, and you'll be rewarded. They shall come near to, to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood. That's upon the altar, the brazen altar saith the Lord God. That's the first thing you see when you enter into the temple. And that will be what the eyes of Jesus Christ will be looking at. From his throne, he looks over there, and he's in the temple. There's the burning. There's the sons of Zadok. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table. Now, there's, I don't think this is just the table of showbread, because we learned the other night that there's there's other tables. Tables where they will uh, slay the meat. Chop it in pieces. So I would think, and I'm not going to downplay these, let's just say, the butchers. To minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. Everything pertaining to the sacrifice. It shall come to pass that when they enter in at the gates of the inner court, they shall be clothed with linen garments, and no wool, as the law has prescribed, Exodus 28, 39, 40, 43, and 39, 27, 28. Wool makes you sweat. Whilst they minister in the gates of the inner court and within. So these, these sons of Zadok get a special charge because of being faithful. And their family gets a special charge. Imagine Zadok, and he will be resurrected, and he'll be there in the moment. Imagine Zadok saying, those are my boys right there. They have been faithful to the Lord. Like Paul says, I have been faithful unto death. I have kept the charge. You know why you keep going as a Christian, even though everybody else is falling away? You be the sons of Zadok. Keep going. Keep fighting. Keep being in the battle. Keep standing. Keep your armor on. And one day God will reward you what they won't get. They shall have linen bonnets upon their heads. Exodus 28, 40, 42, 39, and 28. And shall have linen breeches upon their loins. They shall not gird themselves with anything that causes sweat. And when they go forth, you know, it's funny because they're working at the brazen altar. That's a hot place. But they're not to wear clothing that causes sweat. Not saying they're not going to sweat. To add to the sweat. When they go forth into the utter court, even unto the utter court to the people, they shall put off their garments wherein they ministered and lay them in the holy chambers. So it's going to be like a holy closet for the priest's wardrobe. And the Roman Catholic Church has stolen that today, called a vestry. That's coming back in a millennium. You know, if you look at all the stuff the Roman Catholic Church does, it's the things that the priests have in the millennium. As the Roman Catholics try to bring in their own kingdom without Jesus Christ. And the Roman Catholic Church, with their vestry, no one touches the vestry but those who are allowed. Ooh. You know what it says right here? Holy chambers. You know what the holy chambers means? If you have no right to touch them, you keep your hands off. Matter of fact, holy chambers, if you have no right to be there, you better not be there. Go ask uh, Nahum and, uh, and his brother there. 
go ask that king that was with I think maybe with a good heart offered the incense to, the, to God and got leprosy. Remember the lake of the, there's a there's a pit that's burning in the millennium hell and you don't want Jesus Christ to tell you to go jump in the lake. For those who who don't do what they're supposed to, it's, well, that's later on. They shall put off their garments when they minister and lay them in the holy chambers. Yes. And they shall put on other garments. And they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. I would think maybe you don't walk in to the temple. You don't walk in the temple and up to the brazen altar with your Levi blue jeans. You walk in there with what God has prescribed. You don't walk in there with your loafers. You don't walk in there with your t-shirt. You walk in with what God has prescribed. You don't bring your your programs and your, your little magic shows and your, uh, uh, we're just trying to win the children by giving them candy and stuff. That's not what God said. He said, go in all the world and preach the gospel. You don't come in with your own ideas and your own way. You come in by what God said. Trickery. Of course anybody will say anything and get a lollipop. Neither shall they shave their heads, nor suffer their locks to grow long. They shall only pull their hair, a certain amount of, of hair removal. You don't go all the way bald and you don't go all the way hippie. Neither shall any priest drink wine, 1 Peter chapter 2, when they enter into the inner court. So you better not have alcohol in your breath when you enter into the church. Now what do you do if you walk into church and they got alcohol? Explain that one to your priest. He takes the Lord's Supper in its hoot juice. Neither shall any priest drink wine. Why, when they enter into the inner court. I bet you Roman Catholics probably got a rule against that. Got a loophole. Neither shall they take for their wives a widow. She's been married. Her husband dies. You don't touch her. Nor her that is put away. A woman has been divorced. You don't touch her. But they shall take maidens. Of the seed of the house of Israel, no one else but the house of Israel. Or a widow that had a priest before. Even if she's a priest's wife and the priest died, you don't take her. And that thing, you know, with, with the Israelites, if a, if a brother has a wife and the brother died, the brother raised up the wife to bring seed. That doesn't happen among the Levites. They shall take maidens of the seed of Israel or a widow of a priest. Or a widow that had a priest. Neither shall they take their wives a widow, neither, nor her that is put away, but they shall take the maidens of the house of Israel. Or a widow that had a priest before. Neither shall they take for their wives a widow. Well, I guess maybe it is a priest's wife she could eat they can take. Is she just a regular widow? But if she was a priest for a widow. There's probably one clause too. I, I I think I remember that a priest can only the children of Israel can only marry within their tribes, too. And that would definitely go for Levite, the priesthood. You couldn't marry into Dan, you couldn't marry into Joseph, you couldn't marry into Judah. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane. Is that going on in churches today? Have you got a man in that pulpit? Because Revelation 1 says we're priests and kings, aren't we? Isn't that man getting up in that pulpit telling you what's wrong and what's not wrong? Okay, then explain to me why some churches say sodomite marriages are great and we're going to do them. Explain to me why some church signs say outside the bed, all are welcome. How come some churches have a woman that gets up as a preacher?
How come some churches allow magic? I mean, that's a work of Satan. Exodus. How come some churches allow adultery? How come some churches allow smoking? How come some churches allow drinking? How come some churches allow sin? That was the Corinthian church. They were enjoying the sin. And Paul stepped in there and said, you know, you I've got to write this letter. You're carnal. You kept this man in here in open sin. That ain't right. How come some churches you walk in there, there's a Christmas tree somewhere? How come some churches have got an Easter bunny with eggs? How come you got some churches, Jesus is the reason for the season? How come you got some churches that don't have missionary? How come some churches you can walk in there and get a ticket for a bomb party afterward? And cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. Nail that down in your church door. You go to church to learn what is right and what is not right. According to what God has said. Never mind what you feel. It ain't about what you feel. And remember what we just read early in this chapter. If you're not right with God, your church ain't right. God sets his face against you, calls you idolatry, and sets you as abomination. And in controversy, they shall stand in judgment. And they shall judge it according to my judgment. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all my assemblies. And they shall hallow my, sab my Sabbaths. And this comes across what Paul writes in the Corinthian church too. Why are you taking Christian brethren to court before an unsaved judge? And making the name of God a controversy. You take it to the church. Isn't that what Jesus said? First of all, you take it to the person. If they won't listen, you get another Christian. If they don't listen to Christians, then you take it to the church. Imagine Christians taking other Christians before a unlawful court that doesn't even honor the Bible. And they shall come at no dead person to defile themselves, but for father or for mother or for son or for daughter, for brother or for sister that has that hath no husband, they may defile themselves. So certain family members, what's interesting is the sister that has no husband, what if she's married? Like that we just read about the widow. We read and then there's certain clauses that changes. And after he's cleansed, they shall reckon on him seven days. And in the day that he goeth into the sanctuary, into the inner court, to minister in the sanctuary, he shall offer his sin offering. Well, the millennium does not end sin. Saith the Lord God. It shall be unto them for inheritance. I am their inheritance. Again, still the Levites are God. Levites did not get a part of the land. God was their inheritance. It's still going on in the millennium. And he shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. So that stick. The Levites get no land. What do they get? They get God. And they live amongst the land. To do what? And they shall teach my people the difference between holy and profane. And cause to discern between the unclean and the good. As the Levites are gathered around, it's not those time of year that everybody comes to Jerusalem. They are to be in the cities and towns of their brethren, the twelve tribes of Israel, teaching them what the Bible said, well, what, what the scrolls say, but what the Bible says, how they're to do things, and how they're not to do things. And if you come up to them and say, hey, this guy's bull ran into my daughter, and she's got a nick in her side, then you can take it to the Levite, and he's the judge. And he opens up the scroll to the law and says, okay, this is what God says you need to do. 
Question number one. Has your bull done this before? Well, no, as far as I know. Okay, the law said, but has, you, has your bull did that before? Well, yeah, he's, he guards one of my servants. All right, fry the animal. Well, if I pay you 50 bucks or, or give you oil rights or, you know, I'm the leading person in this church who gives the offer. Oh, okay, go ahead, just go. We'll, we'll take, the, we'll take the, uh, the unguilty guy. We'll take the innocent guy and charge him. No, that's not right. Money talks. Big way. And he shall be unto them for an inheritance. I am their inheritance. He shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. They shall eat the meat offering. So that's how they live. And the sin offering. That's the food. When they bring to the, to the, for God, it goes to the priest. It's the best portion. I don't know if you can say it. There's no second class when it comes to giving to God, is there? You know, the only animal that God says is the second was what uh, Gideon was to give. Because the first bullock was given to uh, Baal. God don't take second best. So guess what the priests are eating? Guess what they're taking home to their wife? They're bringing the best meat, the best dough, the best wheat, the best barley, the best whatever they grew or whatever they're raising. The priests get the best. What, how's your pastor li living? What kind of car is he driving? How about you? What kind of car are you driving? How well are you doing? Huh? Some pastors get the raw end of the stick. Sometimes they don't even get the offering because there is no offering. You spend more money on dog food than you do for your pastor. You ought, let's see how much you know the Bible. You ought to be paying more for oxen food than you are dog food. Let's see how much you know your Bible. Like, well, okay. Am I supposed to get a call? The trespass offering. And every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs. And the first of all the first fruits. So not just the meat, but the first fruits. Of all things. And every oblation of all of every sort of your oblation shall be the priest. Ye shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough. All right, lamb, beef, apples, figs, whatever you do, whatever you dedicate to the Lord, your wheat, that's dough, I would assume, barley, that's your dough, that he may cause the blessing to rest in thy house. Why ain't your church doing well? Why ain't the people doing well? Maybe your pastor's not doing well because you're not giving to the Lord. I've heard so many stories about preachers, pastors, evangelists, driving muckly cars. Or they live by prayer. And I wonder what the people live on their cars. How well are their cars? The church ought to get together and say, Pastor, you have a vehicle for God. We are going to get together. We're going to find what kind of car you want and buy you a brand new car with no payments at all. He ought to be eating well. But he ought to be teaching you, the people, the difference between right and holy. He ought to be teaching you between the clean and the unclean. He ought to be ministering to you. It's his job to take care of the sheep. Not other sheep. His sheep that God has given him. You ought to have a pastor that's teaching you right from wrong and taking care of you and loves you. And seeks you out. And guides you the right way.
and aids you and is standing before God. And you ought to be, if you have you the blessing of pastor like that, you ought to be feeding him the best. Well, we went to church. We didn't go to church Sunday. Uh, we went fishing. We can serve God anyway. Did you get the pastor the best fish you caught? Well, you know we can't go uh, because it's deer season. How many deers did you get? Did you give the good part? Of, I don't know what the good part of a deer is. Did you give that to your pastor? Oh, me, sister, and such and such went to the yarn store and we got a bunch of good. Did you give the pastor's wife the best yarn? You better not find out your pastor was starving at the judgment seat of Christ. And if he was, God will bless him what you didn't, won't get a blessing. And that pastor better be, again, Showing you the holy and the profane and discerning between the clean and the unclean. He better be teaching you what God has to say. And he better be ministering to you. And you better be ministering back. There were a bunch of Levites that we read that left the charge. And God said, you know, hey, they're still going to be there. But you're going to have shame. I don't want to have shame at the judgment seat of Christ. You know why? Because my wife, my family, my church, and my pastor will be standing there to see my shame. The priest shall not eat. Why did I read 30? The priest shall not eat of anything that is dead of itself. All right, you, you know, here's this animal he's walking down the path, he drops dead. That's, that's not for him. Or torn. Oh, Pastor, you know, the wolves got at this chicken the other night. Here, you can have the chicken. No. We kept the good chickens. You can have the ones that were all torn. No, that one's got a half a drumstick. It's okay, isn't it? You know, he's supposed to go after you when the wolves come. You're not supposed to give to him what the wolves have, have left behind. How's that for an illustration? Whether it be fowl, chicken, turkey, quail, or beast. You don't go out in your field and find an animal that's just died overnight. Okay, that, that goes to God. God's, that don't belong to God. That, you just bury it. God, ha, God has proclaimed to us what he wants. And we are to what he has done for us to do what God expects us to do. What did Jesus say? I forget what in gospel he says. You know, there's a servant there. He goes, does his work. And after he's done, the guy comes in. He says, well, serve me. And, you know, do you expect a thank you or anything like that? No, that's your reasonable service. That's our job. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. That is our job. Not to tangle with people who don't love the Lord. Who don't want anything to do with God. That is not, you know, look, Lord, that's what we're supposed to do. Somebody gets saved. You're supposed to raise him up as your own child in the Lord. You're supposed to take care of your pastor. And he's supposed to take care of you. And if you don't have a pastor that's doing what he's supposed to be doing, you need to leave. And if you've got a pastor that's doing what he's supposed to be doing, you're supposed to be taking care of him. 